<laughs> it's good to be with everybody. I don't really, I just walked in, so I don't know who all is, I don't have a monitor in front of me to see who all is here, but for those of you who are watching live and for all the people that may later find this blog, uh, welcome you. It's been a little while since I've done a blog and into coming back at least every other week, so I'm very happy to be with you guys. I love you guys. and appreciate your hearts and your hunger for Jesus. Um, I want to talk about a subject that uh, I think Steve might be on here. It's a subject that I brought up actually in, uh, in Ireland when I was uh, responsible for leading a, a men's meeting. And uh, the subject was called, I, I termed it this, Crucified Language. And um, the, my purpose on teaching this, and yeah, I should look to, my purpose of teaching this or sharing on this isn't really to teach, but just to maybe give you some food for thought and maybe something that we can discuss on a little different angle, not so much of its spiritual reality as much as, you know, why this subject, if it is valid, isn't more common why it's not something that you see a lot of. Um, so, um, you know, um, in teaching crucified language, uh, we're going to be primarily looking at uh, scriptures. Really, I think I'm just going to pick one book and we're going to look at that. But if, if you'll notice, if you ever search this out, uh, the word crucified is used almost as much about us being crucified as it is um, about Christ being crucified. Now I'm not talking about the word death or whatever, but I'm talking about in the, and I'm not talking about in the Gospels because obviously in the Gospels that's pretty much all it talks about him or two other guys on either side of him. Uh, but I'm talking about the exact word crucified and how it is used in the epistles which is not an, it's not talking about an event, it's not talking about a, a kind of death that the Romans used. It's talking about something that happened to us, just like it's talking about something that happened to Jesus. And so, um, in my search and in, uh, over the years to look more closely at this, because it was a, it's an interesting usage, I mean, if you just think about it, crucified language, and it is clearly used uh, in the epistles. <clears throat> um, it's um, it's interesting to me that it is, you know, and most of you know this, I travel a lot. I've been in a lot of churches all over the world. Um, and I just hardly ever hear anybody talking about it. I, I very seldom hear that subject brought up anywhere, not just in churches, but by Christians in general. And um, so, you know, I mean, since we all read the same Bible, <laughs> you would assume that it would be a common subject because it's in the Bible just like any other subject that's brought up um, in the Scriptures. And so, um, you know, as I meditate on that and consider that, and again, I'm not, I'm not, specifically trying to teach on what those what that's about as much as um, giving us food for thought concerning it and concerning its validity um, uh, one reason why some people might think that well this is not an important subject this is not um, something like that it's just uh, uh, it's just not one of those important subjects and so for that reason, I do want to look at the scriptures and just see: is it really, um, is it really important? Is it really not just valid? Uh, I would assume that anything that's in the scriptures is valid. But what place does it hold, and is it an important place? 
So the book that I chose to look at uh, the scriptures that, that are using crucified language here or is the book of Galatians. And of course, for many of you, these scriptures are familiar, but um, for others who may come on this blog, they may not even have considered crucified language. And many of you may never have thought of it in terms of, of, of uh, a, a way of speaking. And certainly the Apostle Paul uses this way of speaking and this language of being crucified. Galatians 2.20 is obviously, for many of us, um, the most common scripture, the one that we feel most comfortable with in talking about being crucified. Uh, and again, I, I reiterate that when I started, um, I said that the scriptures, when using crucified language, almost speak of us as much as Jesus being crucified. And that's a big thing. That's a big deal. So, let's look at Galatians 2.20. Most of you know it by heart. Not all of you do. but um, This is Paul speaking. and He says, I am crucified with Christ. Okay, so that's, I mean, we'll, we'll look at the rest of it in a second. But it's pretty obvious. It's pretty obvious that this is a, a use of crucified language that is turned away from Jesus, as it were, and pointed to us as believers. And, and this is Paul who has been in the ministry for many years. So this is not... Um, this is not him looking at his evil self or his old nature or, or something fallen about him. This is relating to a desire. And he's, he's about to state what, it, what that desire is. Why? You know, if you think about it within much of Christianity, and much, much of Christianity, there would be this thought of why? someone could say to me, why in the world would anybody want to preach or, or embrace the thought that we're crucified? Jesus died so we wouldn't have to be crucified, and on and on and on. And, um, uh, and of course, it, in a certain sense, it would be abhorrent to embrace such a thing. You know, well, you, you know, we don't want to talk about death, we want to talk about life. We want to live. And, and, uh, and I understand all those things, and I understand that all those things have a context and have a place, but it doesn't negate God putting crucified language in there in relationship to us. And so his purpose, his, his goal, in other, words, in other words, he's not just saying, I embrace that I'm crucified with Christ, just because it's in the Bible and just because it's a doctrine and we should all just embrace that we're crucified with Christ. He's not coming at it like that at all. His goal isn't just to be crucified. His goal is if that brings about something greater, then he will embrace that. But that's not his goal. His goal is the next part. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I but Christ liveth in me, and so that's his goal, that not I. The cross is his, his key, his, his way of getting in to the very thing that he desires most, and that is that Christ live in him. Um, I fear that there are some people who would embrace such a teaching with crucified language strictly for, you know, well, um, it's, it's going to be our doctrine about being crucified. And basically all we're going to talk about is being crucified. And you're crucified and I'm crucified. And, and, I'm, and see, and it's interesting because Paul brought this up. He didn't bring this up in relationship that I'm crucified, therefore I can... I can um, um, no longer worry about sin, or no longer worry about the devil, or no longer worry about, you know, those kind of things. When 
The first one that he mentions in this, and we're going to look at two more after this, just in Galatians, has nothing to do with getting rid of something wrong in him. In other words, he's not embracing a cruci the crucified language and the truth behind that crucified language. He's not embracing that to get rid of something, but to gain something. To gain Christ. And, and you say, well, he's already saved. He's not talking about, I'm embracing this to be saved. He's already saved. Yeah, I agree with you. He's already saved. He's embracing this that Christ may live and not him. Okay, so um, now remember when he said this, he was a Christian. He not only was a Christian, but he's an apostle. <laughs> so he's basically saying, um, I don't want, I don't want my, I don't want me being a Christian, get this now, I don't want me being a Christian to live. Because he is a Christian, now he's saying, and not I but Christ. Not me as a Christian, but Christ as my life. Okay, so that's... That's pretty big. Not me being an apostle. You know, look at so many people in churches running around. You know, I want to be an apostle. I want to be a prophet. I want to be... Paul's going, I don't want to be an apostle. I don't want to be a Christian. I want to be dead. I want to be crucified that Christ may live within me. Wow. Um, so, uh, I know we're probably already getting close to... Okay. So, let's look in uh, Galatians now chapter 5, and we're going to look in verses 19 through 24. <clears throat> Alright, so in the second chapter he's addressed the application of being crucified to himself strictly that Christ may live in him, period. And not Christ the Apostle. It's just the life and nature of Christ. Now he's going to address, he's going to add to that, but that's this in chapter 5 is not first. It's fifth because it's in the fifth chapter. This is starting with verse 19 through 24. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies envyings, murders, drunkenness, reveling, and the such like of which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such, such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Next verse, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And then verse 24, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Now, how many of us, if we can be honest, how many of us have ever heard of this teaching and people teach from this and the whole emphasis is either walking after the flesh or walking after the spirit? And while it talks about that, Paul sums up that there's going to be no walking in the Spirit without a putting to death, without a, let's use the right words, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So we kind of look at it like this, I think, someday. <laughs> Maybe not all of us. And that is, okay, I've got all this flesh, and I've got the Spirit, and if I walk in the Spirit, it's going gonna, it's gonna to outweigh the flesh, and then I will have uh, so much of the spirit that all those things won't happen, you know. But see, he says, he, here's how he deals with the flesh that he just talked about. And, and think about verse 19 through uh, 21, how much stuff it named off here. Do you need me to read that whole thing again? Where idolatry, witchcraft, emulations, you know, all of those, all of those things but he calls them the works of the flesh. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. 
Okay. So then he ends with, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. And, and the word lust is just the desires within each one that moves us, that motivates us, that causes them to manifest, that allows them to manifest. So he's using crucified language again, again. And, and he's not... Um, He's not leaning toward the basic teachings that Christianity put as most important. Well, you know, the flesh and the spirit. Now, yeah, they're both there and they're both mentioned. But there is no way that if you walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Because the spirit, if you're just talking about walking in the Holy Spirit... But the Spirit is going to lead you to Christ crucified. He's going to reveal that you're crucified. And Paul says, remember, we talked about that in chapter 2? <laughs> and begin to, to reveal the importance and the necessity now for, you know, if you're, not going to, if you're not going to embrace crucified language or the reality of being crucified, if you're not going to embrace that so that Christ may come forth, then for God's sake, embrace it to get rid of all of this list out of your life. <laughs> okay, um, let's go to chapter 6 now, Galatians, still Galatians. Chapter 6, we're going to read verse 12 through 15. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised. Okay, so... So, the subject here is going to be circumcision, which was the, the number one mark in the Old Testament that you were of God. Okay. Only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Okay, so they don't want, they don't, they would, they don't mind having their flesh cut away, literally with a knife or something, but they don't want their life cut away. They don't want to be persecuted for that, for preaching that we have to be crucified with Christ. So it goes on, For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the, or accept in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Okay, so, so there is this introduction, this 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 um, putting forth that whatever whatever issues it is, whether it's the world or the flesh or whatever, Paul pulls out this crucified language, and then he goes on to say. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And what is he talking about? He's talking about, uh, but God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom I am crucified unto the world and the world unto me. I won't glory in anything in the flesh, I glory in the cross. And the word glory is the word boast. I, I boast. I I don't boast in anything of the flesh. I boast that the cross has taken care of all of that, and there's nothing left to boast in. All right. So the last verse there is, and as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy. And upon the Israel of God, my Lord, this is this is the Israel of God. He's calling to us who have who have placed, as it were, crucifixion as circumcision. And another place it says, "So you're you're the you're the Jew then, the true Jew. You're what it's all about." Because you have embraced the true circumcision. Now, you know over in Colossians it talks about that in different places uh, that, you know, it's, it's clear that 
by Christ, by being crucified with Christ, those things took place for us. Okay, so I just want to finish with reading a couple of statements. Um, my first one is, we are looking through verses with crucified language to see if it has any real significance. So our purpose, even though I explained several of them, it wasn't the teaching end of this that was really my greatest desire. It was that we look to see if being crucified or this crucified language being crucified has any real significance. Well, that has to be asked because you don't hardly see it or hear it brought up or mentioned in so many churches. So is it significant? Okay. My second statement is if, if they, speaking of these scriptures and of crucified language, if they are significant then we are looking at them and asking why are they hardly mentioned in most Christian circles? Okay. So again, food for thought. If it's really valid, if it's, you know, I mean, look at Galatians 2.20. That could quite possibly be one of the top most important scriptures in the whole Bible. Certainly important to the Lord because by our accepting, embracing that crucifixion, He may live. Not just by saying, let Jesus live in me, Father, in a prayer. Um... So that, so why? Why are they hardly? Why? Okay, and then number three. Each one of us must individually be convinced of their significance and determine our own stand in relationship to that. Uh, the reason why I wrote that statement was because that's what happened to me. That's exactly what happened to me. I was told about these scriptures and of things like that um, in relationship to being crucified with Christ. And I, frankly, I couldn't think of one scripture I'd ever read, and I'd already read through the Bible, that I ever talked about that. I didn't know anybody who talked about it. Um, but when I got into the Word of God, and I found out that this was true, that this was important, it was important on a, if I want Jesus to live, if I want... If I want the fruit of the Spirit, or the, you know, if I want um, uh, to have victory over the world, if I want the true circumcision of God, then it's important. Then it's important. So it, it thrusts me into the Scriptures, and it thrusts me into a, a thing. Every, each one of us must individually be convinced of their significance and determine our own stand in relationship to them. And that stand for me was not just that they're true and valid and I will accept this as a doctrine, but oh my God, I think this might be one of the most important areas in the New Testament and I must give myself to know the heart of God behind this. I know many of you have also already done that, but maybe, maybe um, uh, during the discussion time that subject can be brought up. Okay, thanks. Love you guys. Yes, let's pray. Father, I just I just love you so much and you've put things in the scriptures that are meant to tease our desire for you, meant to stir something deep within us, meant to arouse a a a, a thing within us that will will seek that will look beyond what we already know and I ask you Father in the name of Jesus to just continue to move, move on these scriptures but move on all the things that you're doing in all of our lives in all of the locations that we are literally across the, the globe and Lord Make our hearts hungry, not just to lay hold of the terminology and doctrine form, but Father, in the name of Jesus, to lay hold of Jesus, your Son, and the reality that these things of being crucified with Him mean to you and should mean to all Christians. 
Father, we ask it in Jesus' name.